Yeah. introduce you to the last panel of the day, um, which uh, was an idea that came out of, of all things, the event we ran for children uh, last year and which we're running again this year. Um, and one of the participants, in, one, one of the leaders in that, in fact, we collaborated with the um, uh, Clean Coast programme of Antashka and one of the panellists who will join this panel um, said after that event, we, we really need we, we really need to start telling our stories in a different way, uh, or even to tell different stories. And with, that simply was the germ of the idea for this panel, um, which Chris will moderate and, uh, which, uh, and to whom he will introduce you to. But one of the, one I would, I would like to call, first of all, on one of those panelists, who's both a panelist and a musician, Ethan Evrian, and ask her to start off the proceedings uh, by giving us a short performance. Okay, Eva. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're very reluctant again. Well, thank you all very much for coming back after lunch. Um, thank you, Ray. Uh, how I kind of, I, I followed by a pagan rave, and I now have to follow a pagan rave, which is not <laughs> something that I expected to be doing. But before, just to get you all in the mood for our hopefully very wide-ranging and unusual discussion this afternoon, uh, we're going to start off by having Eva play us a few tunes. Well, not oh. any tunes. Uh, <laughs> 
absolutely beautiful, but also far more eloquently than I could with words, kind of it gives you what we want to do in this panel, which is the way that Eva was able to blend the classical and the traditional there in a way that is so powerful and interesting, tells a story of music in a very different way than we normally tell stories of music or think about stories of music. And that's what we're going to do on this panel about coasts and islands and myths and realities, is try and think differently about the stories that we tell about our place. And that's what we've been talking about this weekend is place. And think about the stories that we tell about the past of those places, the present of those places, and the future of those places. And to think about those in, in different ways that allow us, perhaps, to understand our place in the world and how we preserve that place in the world um, a bit better. So we're joined by Professor Dermot Ferreter from UCD School of History, by Killian Quigley, who you all met earlier. We're getting full value out of Killian's trip from uh, Australia, <laughs> uh, from the Sydney Environment Institute. We've got Michael John O'Mahony from Antashka, and obviously Ethan Ivrian, uh, musician, both traditional and classical. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Dermot. You uh, are very on brand for the conference. Uh, you have a book out this year uh, called At the Edge, which is a history of Ireland's offshore islands. Uh, a book that I was very pleased to review recently in the paper, and thankfully, for the purposes of this panel not being horribly awkward, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, I, when I got it in the post, I was like, there's a possibility that this is going to make December very difficult indeed, but the book was absolutely wonderful, and it's great to be able to speak to you about it here in West Kerry, because obviously West Kerry plays a big part in your book in terms of the Blasket Islands at the, being at the centre of much of uh, the way that you talk about the, the history of the offshore islands in the 19th and 20th century. And I wanted to start by asking you, we live on an island, and island is our sense of place as Irish people, but also, we obviously also have these hundreds of smaller islands off the island. Um, what, what did you find about working on these places to be uh, seductive? Like, why did you want to write the book in the first place? Well, I think it started right here in 1977 when I was brought out to the Blaskets for the first time. It's one of my earliest memories, and I do remember being terrified of the vastness of the ocean and the smallness of the boat. It wasn't a correct now. Uh, they were using um, different boats at that stage. Um, but I do remember wondering what it must have been like to live there as a child, but also being intrigued by the idea of it being out there. Uh, and how did that work in practice? Um, and as I grew older and as I became a historian, I remained interested in that subject. Uh, because it did seem to me that it could illuminate uh, themes relevant to the wider Irish experience. If the islands were Ireland to the power of two, uh, well then what could we learn from their experiences? And I was interested in trying to excavate those particular questions. I was influenced, I think, as well by Tim Robinson. Because when I was growing up, Tim Robinson's books on Connemara and the Aran Islands would have been in the house. Um, and of course he became the great cartographer of the Aran Islands. He came over from England in 1972. And Again, going back to this, this question of myth versus reality, he made the point that it wasn't enough to fill a diary of intoxication in relation to the islands. We all know they're beautiful, they're stunning, and how they can look, and how they can enrapture, and how they can beguile. Um, but that wasn't enough, because he wanted to make a contribution to the island community, and he began to map it in great detail. Uh, but he did refer to the immensities in which these little places are wrapped. Um, and that grabbed me. What were the immensities? in which these little places were wrapped? Uh, and the answer, of course, is that it depends on the island that you're on, because they all have unique characteristics. They have extraordinary antiquity and, and, and great richness. Um, but I was also interested then, in the last 100 years, what was the reality? We're well aware of how uh, the islands have that sense uh, of romance. Um, they're intriguing. Uh, the people are different. Um, but what was their relationship with the mainland? That's one of the themes I was really interested in. Um, and in 1997, around the time of the 75th anniversary of the foundation of this state, I was working on an exhibition to mark that particular anniversary. And I was looking for a place to start. And I decided to start on Tory Island because I had found a document also from the year 1922, the year the state was founded. And it was a plea from the Tory Island uh, community. It was written by the priest who was administering to them, Father Carr, and he outlined all of the uh, the great challenges that existed for island communities. And he posed a question which remained with me, who in place of power is big enough to devise a scheme? And of course, that was the challenge for the state writ large. And there it was coming from that remote northwestern Ireland, Tory Island. And the story of whether or not that question was answered or adequately addressed or the difficulties in trying to 
uh, answer that question, that became an enduring theme. You know, were, was the potential of the island, uh, the islands realised? Uh, there was an economic geographer who wrote from Pennsylvania to the government uh, in 1936. Uh, Lester Klims was his name. And he was full of hope and optimism. And he said, you're a young country, you're a young state, you have an opportunity to do wonderful things. He was particularly interested in the island communities. And he said, I'm not aware of any economic geographers in Ireland, but you have got to begin to think about regional planning. And he applied that particularly to the island, the island and the island communities. That didn't happen. And that, of course, is one of the, the main spines of my history of the islands. Um, but it's also about looking at, at, at how each of the individual island communities coped with that and many other challenges. One thing that really comes out of your book is the way that there was no single island experience. There is no obvious story that encapsulates all of the islands because they were all these incredibly diverse communities that have this incredible combination of smallness and vastness. I mean, you talked about the immenseness that was placed on these places and that's something that I found really interesting in the book is the way that the islands became symbols, especially during the time of the National Revival and the Gaelic Revival, became symbolic places of mini Ireland or an, Ir an Ireland that was being lost and could be recaptured. Oh, it's um, about recreating Ireland, you know, drawing on the well of the islands to recreate Ireland. I mean, a lot of the nationalists of that early 20th century, they made pilgrimages to the islands. Uh, people like Patrick Pierce went out to the islands because there was a purity of intonation there in relation to the native language that you couldn't find anywhere else. Um, and I mean, even during the Dáil debates in 1921, one Sinn Féin TD suggested they should declare their republic on the Aran Islands uh, because the Brits wouldn't be able to remove them uh, from the Aran Islands. Uh, and th the reason he chose that, you know, th this is the purest form of independence we have and it's out there. But of course, you've got to consider the practicalities. There are very pragmatic, practical aspects to this. I was interested in the islands that survived as populated and the ones that didn't. And a lot of that has to do with luck. How treacherous is the crossing to your island? Crossing to Tory Island is, is, is very different than crossing to Rathlin Island from Ballycastle, for example. Going out to the Blaskets, you can be deceived by what appears to be a very calm stretch of water when it can be treacherous. So those basic factors uh, also impact it hugely. So you've got to be very conscious of, 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 of the natural environment and also the extent to which the sea always was, is now and always will be the determining factor, the most savage force in the lives of the islanders yeah. and affecting everything. I think that that's something that is really comes out of the book is the, the importance of the sea in the physical nature of the islands, but also in their culture and in their place in the world. And mm -hmm. Killian, if I could turn to you, I, I saw recently that the Marine Institute here in Ireland um, have a map on their website that they publicize and they send out as part of their educational programs, which they call the real map of Ireland. And it draws on this uh, undersea mapping exercise that they did of all of Ireland's territorial waters. And the real map of Ireland, as in Ireland's territory, broadly conceived, water and land, is 10 times the size of the island of Ireland and its smaller islands itself. So we are, in some ways, inevitably a maritime nation. Um, you know, you work on the undersea, you work on the aesthetics of the sea. Mm. Uh, how do you think that island nations, island communities that are surrounded and inevitably impacted by the sea think of themselves and how does the sea impact on how they think of themselves on land? That's great. Um, yeah, this, this, this map um, fascinates me because um, I guess it, it, it seems like a signal example of the, the opportunities for a kind of um, reorientation or, or revision um, that are made available when we think from spaces like um, the undersea, right, as opposed to um, Thinking about, thinking about ourselves as firmly situated on dry land, um, thinking about what dry land looks like from, from the ocean. I was thinking when you were talking, Dermot, about your trip in 1977. Growing up in Nebraska, my opportunities to engage with the undersea were limited. Um, but part of that sort of like rediscovery of my relationship to Irishness that I mentioned to earlier had to do with spending increasing amounts of time here and spending increasing amounts of time in the water swimming and scuba diving, which I learned to do in Ireland and which I spent a lot of time doing in Australia. And I became really interested in the challenges 
that an environment like the undersea posed and has posed um, to uh, obviously you know, certain kind of practical challenges, obviously, um, but also the ways that these challenges have have furnished, let's say, um, opportunities. Um, how how the undersea has acted as a kind of imaginative threshold, right? Um, beyond which maybe like some original and interesting thinking can take place. Um, how should or how do island communities think about the undersea? What I like so much about what Dermot was talking about was this idea that it's sort of impossible to, to generalize and that really this is about localizing these contexts. And I think that's something that's particularly important with the submarine because I think that often in culture the undersea is mobilized as an abstraction. Um, but of course, as, as we all know, in fact, submarine place um, is wrapped up in all kinds of amazing social, cultural um, histories, right? I was talking to a woman just a few minutes ago about an amazing project down in Baltimore and West Cork to do with submarine archaeology. Um, these are the kinds of the kind of work that I think needs to happen, particularly at this moment um, when we all come to better understand the stakes of, of marine health um, for all of us, right? And uh, there's a lot of thinking that we need to do about what we want um, to happen with and in and through the sea in decades to come, because as we all know, things are happening. Um, and well, if I could, yeah, if I could bring Michael John in there. I mean, one of the, the themes that we were talking about with Dearman's book is uh, the difference between the myth and the reality, you know, that the islands are this mythologized place of the pure Gaelic cult culture and so on, but at the same time, they are these extremely isolated places that have treacherous crossings and harsh realities and the, the myth and the reality don't always meet up. I mean, Killian alludes to the great challenges that coastal places have environmentally now. Um, how do you feel that the myth and the reality of our coasts, our, our coasts are, you know, we look out the window, it's beautiful, this is what we, when we think of home and when we show the, to the world is, is our, our sort of pristine coastline. But with your work with Antashka and the Clean Coasts programs and stuff, it seems that there's there's a reality there that is quite troubling as well in terms of the not fitting that image. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I suppose if you do look out the window, what you'll notice is at the high, high water mark, there's, there's plenty of plastics. And um, I suppose, I'll just step it back maybe a tiny bit. I think our coasts, I studied geology for many years. If you look at the backdrop behind us, that's basically the intersection of our time now with the time of 400 million years ago when there were volcanoes out of the tear up there in Inish, Nebro and all these places. And uh, I suppose it's, it's our intersection with that at any given time is, I know it's quite a weird construct, but I'm trying to look at that and use that in a number of ways. I think the evidence is there, it's, it's more than stark. It's, it's absolutely, unfortunately I'd use the word, in, in, the, in the realm of the four horsemen. Uh, and one of the areas that we are particularly in, in a worrying state is, is to do with our, with our oceans. Two-thirds of the planet is covered with ocean. Ireland is a very maritime place. What we're looking at here is, again, as I said, that, that intersection. And I suppose particularly one of the things is the, our, our effect, or the anthropomorphic effect, particularly over the last 100 years. Um, from our point of view in Ireland as well, we're a, uh, we're, 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 we're a fantastic, we have some of the best landscape in the world. Um, but there are costs and there are responsibilities and there's custodianship and stewardship that actually comes with that. Um, what we're trying to do is um, look at the, uh, I suppose the, the word preservation often I associate with jam, but <laughs> in this case it's, it's to do with, 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 with us really. Um, I don't want to be the one on the panel who's bringing the, the four horsemen to the table, but we're, we're, we're heading, I did, fair enough. <laughs> It was, it was skillfully done. It's to, um, I suppose, the, the biggest resource we have that's, that's dwindling is, is time to, to turn this around because um, we actually forget how important the coast, the sea, is to our actual existence. It is the ultimate, what we call, ecosystem service. This is, we're now seeing evidence that all of this climate issue that we're seeing now, it's actually being masked for now by, um, by the oceans taking up the heat. This creates the acidification, so when... Mm you're diving in the barrier reef, you're now seeing bleached, bleached corals, etc. To bring it back home, what we have is, I'm hopeful. I'm a smiling pessimist. Um, 
from the point of view of, um, I suppose, one of the things, and I mentioned it to some of the speakers earlier, is we're now trying to find, and this is a fantastic opportunity here at, at the edge, is to look at finding cultural resonances for all of us to actually understand who we are and what we should be doing. The time element is, we, we, we can look at the history of it, but we also need to look at the future. And it's finding those cultural resonances because we are in trouble from the point of view of the facts. We're in a post-truth era. People are more interested in their feelings and their emotions than they are about the facts. So it's a case of turning that on its head to get a very positive, sustainable solution. Finally, I suppose from our point of view, we have a, a local and, and national responsibility in that we have that huge area, that the real map of Ireland scenario. We have, there's stuff out there we don't even know what's out there. But as what we do see, unfortunately, what you do see out there is you see the wrappers from the chocolate bars at six and a half thousand metres depth. Now, they didn't just turn up for no reason. So I do think that particularly the work we do, ours is very much, it's focused on the communities we work with, enabling them to actually get on with it, um, facilitating them and just letting them loose with it in a, in, a, in a very, I suppose, our whole thing is listen, learn and then lead. So that's kind of where we're coming that's from. That's really it. interesting about the intersection of culture with understanding our natural environment because that's something that comes out of Dermot's book as well is the relationship between the islands as places that are obviously physical places that have particular maritime challenges but also that were em endowed and held to hold this vast as you said pure Gaelic culture that had to be preserved that has an emotional pull on uh, Irish people and I wonder, Aoife, if I could ask you, you know, Michael John used the word preservation there. I know you work with the Irish Traditional Music Archive, yeah. and you also work in both traditional music and classical music. How do you feel about the nature of cultural preservation? Do, should cult can culture be, you know, the, the people who went to the islands in the early 20th century wanted something to be preserved or, that, or brought back? Um, is that how we should think about culture? Do we need to preserve it, or is there something evolutionary about the way that we think about it as well? Well, when we talk about culture, we're talking not just about the music, obviously, we're talking about the language, we're talking about a full way of life. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I was brought up in a family where we speak Irish to each other every day. I went to a Gaelic school in Dublin, in the north side of Dublin, mm -hmm. and, you know, we played DAA, we played traditional music, but I came from a family that were a hub and, like, kind of luckily in an area where there was actually a lot of pipers. So for me, growing up with the tradition and the culture around me was the norm and I couldn't understand anything outside of that for a long time and you know because we play music as a family you know we would have spent a lot of time here in Baden Erterich like with Winter Begioch or out on the Iron Islands actually the Gael school I went to this the primary school I went to when we were in fifth class they took us to in this year to live there for three weeks to understand you know kids our own age who had been brought up on the island and some of the questions we asked each other was ridiculous like have you never been to Dublin airport what you know what have you been doing for the last 11 years that kind of thing you know and um we couldn't get over this like they were saying oh we're going into town on the boat and we're going where's town like Dublin they're like no Galway we're like Galway's not a town you know you know 11 year old innocence that Dublin is like the capital of the world because you know just the way you're brought up, you know, you go into Dublin, it's the big city, and, you know, you think you're class going in there for a day out. But, you know, I don't know, I think, honestly, Irish music as a whole is in a safer place than it's been in a very long time. Having had discussions with my dad, with my granddad about this, um, and especially with the work the Irish Traditional Music Archives are doing, like so many field recordings, there's a huge amount of content from, you know, wax recordings, wax cylinder recordings. There's a fantastic recording from like the Lilliput Fesh from, you know, 1902, which is just outrageous. The music is beautiful. I mean, hard to hear through a wax cylinder recording, but the content is incredible. And then, of course, culture and unfortunately music is one of our largest exports. So many of our recordings that we now have in the archives are because people emigrated to America and the facilities were there for them to record. So while I believe the language and music has gone from strength to strength, having, you know, diminished at very substantially in the, well, I would say 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, 
that would have been the time when my grandparents both moved to Dublin. And one of the things my grandfather used to speak about quite a bit was um, he used to be a milkman, so he used to be delivering milk. And there was a tower, there was a block of flats, a tower in Ballymun, where they only spoke Irish. You know, so there, there is culture, and it's kept, and the people and the communities keep it alive, and have been doing, and will continue to do so. So I would never worry about losing it. I worry about exporting it. Like, we export it quite a lot and sell it for something that it's not really. You know, there's this concept of Walt Disney Irish music, and that's genuinely what it is. I mean, at this moment in time, my sister is working for Walt Disney playing Irish music in Orlando. So she is one of our exports, and she's a phenomenal musician. Will she do it forever? No, but she's out there doing that. She's selling a part of our culture, and she's selling, in a way, her own identity. So I question, and my brother and sister question as well, what is our identity? Have we been brought up to be a certain thing? Does that mean we can't be something else? And that comes into it with classical music as well. So there's been people that have said to me in the classical industry, but you couldn't possibly play, play classical music because you're, you're a trad head. And, you know, people would turn around to me, and this is no joke, they'd say, oh, you know, that was a great gig after a classical gig. I thought you just did the diddly eye stuff. And you're kind of thinking, did somebody, act, did somebody actually just say that? And, you know, you're, you're kind of saying, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I do do the diddly eye stuff. You know, it's kind of what we all do, you know, in the traditional circuit. So, I mean, I do. <laughs> it's funny. I, I really believe it's in the best place it's ever been. But there is still a certain amount of ignorance towards it in that I don't think people fully understand the depth and richness of our culture. And, you know, starting at home, there are people that don't understand it. Maybe it's that they don't want to understand it. Mm -hmm. But what fascinates me the most, and I'll finish on this point, is just, you know, we have university degrees, we have masters in Irish traditional music and folklore. And we have a huge amount of people from Russia, China, America, England, you name it who have spent years studying our tradition, who have spent years trying to understand where it comes from, why we are as we are. And what, you know, it shocks me because I've never studied it. I've never taken it as a subject. I've never sat down and said, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to learn how to be a real gale. Like, I'm going to sit in the kitchen and listen to loads of archive recordings and tomorrow I'm going to be a savage traditional musician. Like, that, that was never a question. That was never a concept. This was just something that was like bread and butter to the table. And I have a massive amount of respect for these people that come in and study it to within an inch of its life. But they miss the subtleties, and that's what we are so lucky to have. And I studied in France when I was 15, and I remember my violin teacher, a classical musician, leader of the orchestra in Nantes, a fantastic person, phenomenal player, turned around to me and said, any student from Ireland that I've had, they're so musical and they're so capable, but they lack discipline. And that really resonated with me as a teenager as well, because it's true. We are very laid back. Things come very easy to us, and especially in terms of musicality, there is an enormous amount of talent and potential in this country that we don't necessarily always tap into. And that comes into it with the language as well. Like the, the quickness that Irish children have in picking up a second language, like, it's really f phenomenal. So, it's you amazing know, what you say about, about the language and growing up in Dublin with the language, I think yeah. is really fascinating because it's definitely, you know, you growing up in Dublin, speaking Irish, playing traditional music, in some ways is what people who were going to the islands as nationalists in the late 19th, early 20th century would have been dreaming of, except that they would have been dreaming of, I suppose, everyone doing it and Dublin looking very different to the way that it did look. I wonder, Dermot, if I could ask you about the, the, na the, na the, the question of the language, because the government's attitude towards the islands in terms of su supporting them, preserving them and so on, was tied up with the idea of keeping the language alive. But keeping it alive in a way that was very problematic in the sense that it seems to be about keeping it alive in these specific places as opposed to reviving it in a general sense. How did you find the, the language question in terms of looking at communities which overwhelmingly still were Irish speaking throughout their inhabited uh, periods. It's fascinating to read the, the notebooks of John Milton saying he goes out to the Iron Islands in 1898. Uh, he wants to learn the language and, and he gets friendly with some of the islanders. He wants to write the language too. Uh, he's struggling with it, but he's completely dazzled by its beauty and by the way it is spoken. Uh, and he puts a lot of effort in it and he, into it and, and, and tries to do justice to it. Uh, at a later stage, Obviously, there, there is an island literature that was produced by the islanders themselves, particularly here in the Blaskets. Uh, 
Um, but a lot of people read that in translation. And this is something that Flann O'Brien used to complain bitterly about um, when he wrote on Bell Bucht, of course, as a parody of this kind of literature. Um, and he wrote privately that he was trying to get under the skin of uh, a gale I find the most nauseating in Europe. Um, and he wrote to Sean O'Casey that that was his aim in, in, in Unbail Booked. But he made a very important point, and this relates to your point about subtlety, that the translations were not doing justice to an Irish language that was a spectrum of grad graduated ambiguity. So the nuance was lost. The feeling was lost. He admired Untalanach by Tomás O'Grehan, even though people thought Unbail Booked was taking the complete mickey out of it. That's not what his point was. His point was about uh, that translation. So a lot of those subtleties were lost. And you could say the same about government policies. Uh, didn't have much subtlety. Um, I mean, there was an idea um, that the education system needed to be about the revival uh, of, of the Irish language, and that needed to be its main focus. Um, but, you know, that education system, you know, was, uh, was only relevant to a point. Um, it, you can't eat that scenery, you can't eat that culture, and, you know, this talk about uh, language and whether or not it was associated with brands of poverty. Uh, Irish was not the language of commerce. That was a huge challenge for many of the islanders. The Folklore Commission collectors who went around uh, to collect and preserve um, the uh, traditions um, of, of, of rural Ireland, including the islands, they went to the islands, and they were frequently told when they went looking for Irish language speakers, there's only a handful of them left. They're very old. <coughs> Irish was discouraged by many of the islanders when the kids were growing up because they didn't think it would be of much use, and of course many of them were going to end up uh, emigrating. Um, and that was part of a wider uh, problem, and it was part of the issue around how the language was uh, approached. Uh, this question of, of uh, preservation and promotion, uh, and where was the balance to lie? Uh, and it goes back to the issue of a proactive uh, linguistic policy. What does it mean? Reg Hindley spent time on Cape Clear in the late 50s and early 1960s to specifically to look at an Irish speaking language as Cape Clear was and he came to quite positive uh, conclusions but the difficulty was the young people. The young people are not thinking of an island future, a Cape Clear future for themselves so the language wasn't going to survive uh, you know only a, on, on a very small basis. So, I mean, that was the language problem uh, in Ireland writ large. There was, there was an awful lot of championing uh, of the idea that they were the last outposts of the Gale. But the problem with them being the last outposts uh, for the native speakers uh, lies in the very description. It was an outpost. It wasn't part of a, uh, an overall cultural vibrancy or cultural vitality. It was, it was about really clutching at straws. Yeah, I mean, there was a bit in your book that, well, there are a number of books, bits that really struck me, but there's a bit that struck me about the language of the Gaeltacht the Commission in 1925 was having these hearings about the future of the language and the future of the, of the, of the Irish-speaking regions. And uh, the chairman seems to get very irritated by the local priest on Aaron Moore saying it's that the people want education in the English language. Yes. And the, the chairman says to him, do they not realize they have something that the rest of us have not got? Yeah. And the priest says, no, they don't, because to them, England, Scotland, and America is the future, not Aaron yeah. Moore. And he, he also made the point that he, they felt that the US and Scotland were better to them than Ireland was. Um, and I mean, that was a damning indictment. You have it there in the middle of the 1920s in relation to the wealth of the commission. Uh, and there is officialdom, flabbergasted that these people do not realize what they have, uh, which brings us back to the question of whether they could eat that. And what was also relevant, because the, the Irish government really wanted to see Irish language um, uh, self-sufficient communities, but the main industry for, for the islanders was kelp and fishing. And it's astonishing to think there were 65,000 people employed in fishing in Ireland in 1829. And as the Guelta Commission discovered a century later, there were less than 1,000 full-time fishermen in Ireland in the 1920s. That was the scale of the decline. Now, that wasn't all the government's fault, you know, because the mackerel moved, you know. Uh, so th that was part of it. Uh, but it, it was also about matching this commitment to the promotion of the Irish language with investment in the fishing industry. Do you know the, the budget for the um, entire uh, 
uh, Department of Fisheries in 1924 was 25,000 uh, pounds, and it was a junior uh, ministry. It wasn't promoted, it wasn't taken seriously. And, you know, as, as you trace the evolution of that policy or lack of policy, you can see how that also impacts on fundamental themes like the speaking of the language and the preservation of the language, because they can't exist outside of the social and economic realities. I mean, that relationship between culture and the maritime realities of the islands, I suppose, is sort of what, Michael John, you were talking about in the sense of finding ways for people to connect with something that is under threat in terms of our marine environment. And I wonder, that question that was posed of the Irish-speaking uh, people on Aaron Moore, do they not realise they have something that the rest of us have not got? That's kind of a question that is being asked of coastal of, of people who have stewardship of coastal communities, I guess, around the world in terms of the sustainability that we have culturally, but especially environmentally. How do you feel that we are doing, what do you think that we need to do to do better than the Four Horsemen sort of version of understanding both that question to make people care, but also to understand the, our responsibility for these places on the edge? There's two elements to that. The first is, as we were talking about place, it's, it's kind of what possessive noun you put in front of us. Is it our place, your place, the place, etc.? cetera? Um, as we have developed into this kind of socioeconomic, technical monstrosity that is the modern world, a lot of those things have been disconnected. I think what Dermot described is a massive disconnection with, with our seafaring um, lifestyle. Now, probably sustainability wouldn't have been high in a priority when you're at a state of survival. But from our point of view, we hear the, a, a, a lot of issues, not just in coastal, but in, in the whole area of particularly biodiversity in nature, is nature deficit disorder. We are so completely disconnected now from who we are and what we are that we have created this own false narrative, that we are invincible, that we can do anything. And I think what's going to be the challenge for the next 12 to 15 years is actually reconnecting there. And it's quite amazing when you take... Um, all the different demographic sections for all the sort of, of, of groups we deal with, both in areas like coastal, ocean, water, biodiversity, waste, energy, climate, is once they get that connection. So it's, it's to actually, we've all seen the pictures of um, the uh, albatrosses from Midway Island in, um, in the Pacific, and they're literally full of plastic. Well, if I was to bring you in a gannet probably from here, it'd probably be the same situation. And that's where I'm coming back to from the point of view, of we need to bring these cultural resonances back. Whether it's music, I completely agree. We have a nuance that gives us a massive advantage internationally. Um, we punch way, way, way above our weight. As communicators, we are absolutely sublime. But I think as Homer Simpson says about drink, it is the cause of and the solution to all of our problems. <laughs> um, and that can be, that, that ends up in what we see in the most simplest of, of environmental issues, which is everyone thought litter. Why would you be worrying about litter? It's not a problem. 50 years later, it's a massive problem because we have literally the oceans, are, it all ends up in the ocean. So when it comes to litter doing surveys years ago, we have what was called a classic say-do dichotomy. What's the thing you think is the worst thing about all oh, litter, it's awful. How often do you drop litter? Eh, maybe three times a day. So you have this, and it's, it's trying to disconnect that. Um, we have embraced certain cultural elements, Western cultural, far quicker than anyone else. And things like, like there, there are huge um, custodianship and cultural issues to be dealt with in areas like agriculture and farming. Um, uh, the, 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 the sea is the other one as regards, um, particularly for, for us, the, the sea is, is, is just, I think we've, We've disconnected from it, but I now see we're reconnecting through things like the blue economy, blue health. You know, doctors now prescribing um, people to, you know, literally take a 20-minute walk in the, at the beach in the forest. And we're seeing these. Some of our groups, we intersect with some very strange group. Well, not strange groups, but groups you wouldn't expect that we'd be intersect with, particularly on coast care, where groups go out and they take custodianship of their stretch of beach. So it could be Dingle Bay. And they, they clear it up. They're generally quite depressed when they go back every week and there's more fresh litter from the 1950s. Stuff is turning up from the 1950s with nouveau French franc on it. Perfect plastic bottles. So that's from 52 to 54. So we're, we're getting the, the, the negative resonance, right? But we also need to see the positive resonance. We also need to see 
that our, um, you know, looking at things like our cetaceans, um, our birds, all the things at the top end of, of the eco ecological pyramid are in good shape. They are the canaries in the mine as regards that. And it's, it's trying to, to bring people along. So we put a huge amount of time and energy and resources into getting people. You can lecture the stuff the cows come home. You need to bring people out. They need to see it. Then they have that aha moment. And the one thing we have found more than anything else as regards sustainability is in Ireland particularly, it's not driven by awareness or knowledge. It's driven by opinion leadership among peers. And we set up every opportunity we can to really bolster that and really allow that, and we then get this cascade effect, and we can literally stand back and let the communities get on with And they step change and paradigm change right throughout it. They're coming back to us, and I can't answer the questions. And that's the best thing we can possibly have. I mean, that's really interesting that you say about like peer, peer opinion. It's basically about the creation of a culture, isn't it? Because if you create a culture that respects certain things and has certain norms, then people will do it regardless of whether you're telling them to or whether you're forcing them to or whatever else. And it makes me think about, uh, Killian, the idea of sustainability is obviously mm. one that is uh, very relevant to your work on the undersea and to the and to wider maritime environments. But I wonder, have you, in terms of, because you have worked previously on ideas of the sea, the aesthetics of the sea and so on, how do you, in terms of thinking about these issues culturally, right. relate that to the science? Right. Um, because the two obviously go hand in hand in the yeah. same way that the physical space and the culture go hand in hand. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Chris mentioned before, I work for something called the Sydney Environment Institute. And in, in some ways, my colleagues and I are conventional academics and that we're all trying to publish papers and, and, and do the things that, that we have to do. But at least half of our time is spent trying to sort of design and facilitate projects that address themselves to environmental problems whether climate adaptation or food security um, or something like coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef in ways that bring people together from all different disciplines in the hopes of asking new questions, creating new knowledge, essentially engineering new ways of thinking, sort of along the lines of like what we've all been doing here for the past two days. Um, this intersects a lot with what Michael was saying as well we hear a lot from marine biologists, marine geoscientists, um, about frustration um, in terms of um, mobilizing the kind of knowledge that is, that we, as we all know, is readily, copiously available, right? Um, mobilizing that in a way that is going to feel real to people, or maybe I should say to make people feel for it, right? Um, so we're constantly working on not only coming up with new academic projects, but coming up with new educational projects, um, producing public programming um, that helps people understand the relationship between, for example, um, an artist's relationship to seascape um, and a coastal geomorphologist's relationship to wave motion, right? Just to give you one example. Um, picking up also on something that Michael was saying before, when we talk about concepts in science like biodiversity, I think we have an opportunity in the present because we're all quite mindful of, of what's going on um, to have a more open conversation about what, why exactly it is that we're interested in something like biodiversity, right? What sort of values we attach to that. Um, this comes to the question of culture as well, right? Um, we need to have open conversations, we need to have debates about why we want to conserve or encourage certain environments. There are obviously economic arguments to be made, there are cultural arguments to be made, social arguments, aesthetic arguments, and so on. I think for too long we haven't been very good at actually having those conversations in the open and inviting lots of people, lots of different kinds of people to participate in those conversations. Um, and I think right now we have an opportunity to, to do that in a way that, that could be very Productive. That's very positive, and it actually reminds me of something that Eva, we were talking just briefly before we came on of um, the way that you talk about the impact that music can have, the impact that the arts can have on people physically as well as in terms of their mental health, um, in terms of the way that they think about themselves, the way that culture can connect us to issues that often seem difficult for us to understand. Um, when you think about your own music or when you think about art in general, how do you think that 
how does it relate to the way that we think about ourselves? Like, is it just about artistic expression or is there something there that is, that is deeper and, and more, uh, I guess, emotional, but also psychological in terms of our place in the world or our places as individuals? I mean, there's many ways to look at this. So, for example, just speaking about what Dermot said earlier, that the people on the islands had something we didn't have. Um, I actually, well, I started reading the book about halfway through, and it's, it's really fantastic. But it made me think about friends I grew up with from Karna, from, obviously, that's not the island, but it's on the edge of Connemara, and being out in the islands, that they, they kind of had a weight on their shoulders because they were the next generation of a culture so rich that, you know, I was, I always felt very fortunate when we went to like festivals like Fela do Inu, it's a Shannon's festival in Karna, that, that we were accepted into this society because we somehow belonged because we grew up in somehow the same way, even though our hub of Gwail goers and traditional musicians in Dublin was significantly more spread out than what they had because they were such a close-knit community. And I think personally, um, in terms of, as you said, like mental health is a huge thing at the moment. And I do believe music has a huge role to play in that. Not just personally, but I don't know if anyone ever watched Shea Moleach. It's this great show on TG Car at the moment, but there's a fantastic fiddle player called Frankie Gavin, who touches very lightly on the subject of Irish music and the effect it has on people outside of our island and how it is a language in itself. You know, you don't have to speak Irish to be Irish. You don't have to you know, there's, there's no kind of box you have to tick to understand your own culture. It's always there. And his, his point of view was that this music we have and the way it's performed by us or felt by us, I think is a better way to put it, is so electric and connects with so many people and there's no language barrier anymore. You know, and that does have a huge and positive impact on people's mental health because that does give you a place and that does give you a place to belong. And then it does encourage you to maybe also look into the language more. And even myself, in, in secondary school, I was extremely lucky. I had fantastic teachers from Inishmore, from Inishman, from Inishir. And if it hadn't been for them, I'm not sure I would have learned the same richness of language as I did. Because again, then we're looking at our different dialects of Irish. How many families have worked for so many years to keep a depth, to keep a richness, to keep that kind of fluidity through the generations of like who you are, that gives you a place. It doesn't, it doesn't give you an identity. It's not like ready-made. This isn't something like, you know, it's not an Ikea flat pack. You don't just build it up in a day. But it is something that's there and it's something that's very real. So, you know, especially coming from the classical world as well, um, I studied in East Germany in Leipzig for eight years and I was ashamed to tell them that I played Irish music because they would not accept it. And I found that very sad after a few years, so I did tell them. And one of my lecturers called me a gypsy. <laughs> I was like, that's, that's, not, that's not really what it means. You know, that's not... But, you know, for them, it's like us and them. And that's not just about Irish music. That's not just about our culture. That's about folk music, full stop. But then what struck me as being very amusing is that, you know, Amy Beecher, classical composer, wrote the Gaelic Symphony in America. And when I stood up and talked about this and talked about Chief O'Neill and how he went around Chicago collecting tunes from Irish immigrants on public transport, he had Irish policemen listening for tunes and they would come back and sing them to him and he would write them down. Yeah. We have O'Neill's 1001 Irish tunes. That's one of our finest pieces of archival material at the moment, thanks to him and his sense of identity and place and culture in America, in There's Chicago. something really interesting about the the interdependence of place that your story Absolutely. and that story shows, which is that your Irish language, traditional music family in Dublin, as you said, was in some ways facilitated by people who had come from another place, these islands that Dermot talked about, which were interdependent on the state and with the mainland for the access and the support mm. that they needed to survive as communities. And is there perhaps some way, Dermot, that that interdependence was very slow to permeate the official mind in terms of the way that the islands were thought about. Do you think that they were viewed as a segregated problem or were people aware of the this interdependence of communities? The islanders constantly fell between the stools of different government departments. You can see that there right from the beginning. And, you know, when they're discussing great tragedies that occur, because that's another part of the island experience, of course, the great sea tragedies that bring them into 
the national consciousness and the government um, then you know, convenes meetings. And the question is, who's responsible for the islands? The congested districts board from the late 19th century under British rule was never replaced by the government. There was no obvious authority for the islands. So you have the Department uh, of Finance and the Department of Local Governments and the Department um, of Industry and Commerce, the Office of Public Works, and it's like past the parcel, you know. So there's no coherence there. Um, you know, when you look at Scotland and the Highland and Islands Development Board, you know, they have a specific group there. Of course, you're dealing with a larger group of people, but still, uh, you know, that idea of an overarching authority. Uh, there were requests by islanders, because they started to get much more proactive in, uh, in the 1970s in demanding that the government take them seriously by having a body that would have overall responsibility for the islands, and that was refused. But what was most revealing uh, in the 1970s uh, was a a memorandum from the Department of, of Finance in reaction to yet another threatened evacuation of an island, this one in Ish Turbot in 1975, uh, the Department of Finance decided that it might be better to allow the natural drift to, to the mainland to continue. Now, you know, that is extraordinarily revealing. And as islanders saw, this was not a natural drift. Um, and there was a positive reaction in many ways. I mean, Tarlac the Blackham was very interesting there for Minish Man when he talked about the need to educate both mainland and the islanders out of what he called the banishment syndrome. We have to start uh, pooling our resources. We have to come together as island communities. We have to start looking at the feasibility of island industries. The Inish Man Knitting Company, of course, became uh, hugely successful. Matt Murphy arrived in Shirkin, 1975, set up a marine biology center, which attracted hordes of researchers. And again, going back to the, the immensities on the islands of what could be learned from studying marine biology or plant life or bird life on, on the islands, you know, very uh, positive experiences and, and people being able uh, to think about a, a, a different kind of future for the islands. And, and Rathlin Island did that as well, often neglected. It's the only populated island in Northern Ireland. Um, when, you know, when they looked at what that island had to offer, not just the islanders, but uh, people visiting the islands. So quite a lot of, of, of quite positive dynamics were developed. And yet, there was still a sense that they were a breed apart. They were a people apart. And they were different in many ways. The islanders themselves would often say that they were going out to the mainland. They weren't going into the mainland. They have that very strong sense of, of, of place. Here, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and that tells you a lot, too, uh, about how they see. Um, I've, I've used the example of a Padre O'Donnell novel, because Padre O'Donnell, great social Republican activist, but also his first teaching post was on an island, uh, Inish Free Island in Donegal. Uh, and he wrote novels about, uh, that were set on the islands, and one of them in 1975 uh, has a, a, called Proud Island, has a character, Mary Jim, and he says, what have we to do with Ireland? What notice did Ireland ever take of us? And that sense of Ireland and the islanders uh, being very different. Uh, but there has been more of a recognition, I think, in, in, in recent years that there, there is an, uh, uh, an interdependency, but also that uh, we have a still... Uh, all of us, we do have that sense of island issues being important. They still come into current affairs regularly. You know, there was plenty of coverage yesterday of, of disputes over access to the Aran Islands, uh, flights to the Aran Islands, when there are uh, controversies about island schools and about whether or not the mainlanders are entitled uh, to, to many of the same rights that we take for granted. Uh, they do come in like that, but they have had to think about themselves as 21st century destinations. When James Singh wrote his, his book, The Aran Islands, way back um, in, in, uh, in the early 20th century, um, he, his publisher sent the manuscript to a number of different intellectuals, including John Macefield, the poet, and he said, this is a brilliant book. The problem is it's going to send scores of tweeted beasts to the, Ar to the islands. <laughs> and, and of course, that was, in the sense, the beginning of the, the, the tourism for the islands. And, and that was often seen as a double-edged sword. Uh, but again, the islanders had to be very pragmatic uh, in how they approached that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the, and again, going back to the way we started, there was no one island tourist experience either. Uh, and it could create pressures, but it could also create great opportunities. And the challenge, of course, was to find a balance. And we don't need to be overly pessimistic. I could tell you, of course, in overall terms, the, the decline of the island population is stark. I started in 1841 when there were 211 populated offshore islands, 34,000 people on those islands. Now it's just under 9,000 in the region of 60 islands. It could have been worse 
You know, and the, and the fall off in the population in recent times uh, has been modest enough to suggest that there are islands that have a very vibrant future. Um, and it's going to come back to the, the vibrancy of the islanders themselves uh, and their imaginations and, and, of course, their resilience and all of the other traits, the positive traits that we quite rightly associate with them uh, over the years. Uh, but you cannot do it in complete isolation. Yeah, I think that that's really what's come out of talking to all of you in your very different fields is the way that interdependency is the key to understanding sustainability, whether it's about culture, whether it's about economies, or whether it's about our environment. And that phrase about going out to the mainland, I think, is something that is really interesting about a sense of perspective. You know, we've been talking this afternoon trying to understand how we can think about the wider world from the perspective of unusual places on the coasts and on the edges by looking at them slightly differently. And they, they magnify bigger issues, don't they? Mm -hmm. In the sense that that issue of sending the hordes of tweeted people to the islands. I mean, the sustainability of all of the people who want to come to the west of Ireland is a huge social, cultural, and environmental challenge for us today, in the sense that it is a very popular tourist place and that put, puts pressures socially, culturally, and environmentally on us. And meeting those challenges, I think what we've tried to, to get out of the, the, the panel this afternoon is, is multifaceted. It, it requires a sense of culture, it requires a sense of identity, it requires a sense of place, and it requires understanding that all of those things exist in connection to each other, not in some sort of isolated way as they were treated. So I'd like to thank all four of you for chatting to me, um, and we're going to impose on Aoife again uh, to ask her because uh, to play for us um, as the last part of Ireland's Edge. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, this is actually one of those classical pieces that's been influenced, and I say influenced, by folk music and Romanian folk music at that. But it's something that resonated with me on the topic of this discussion panel because it's written by a man from Belgium who was influenced by folk music from Eastern Europe but was also influenced by folk music from Ireland but never, let's say, got the subtleties of it. But it's just, for me, one of... It's quite a dissonant piece. And for me, it kind of described how I felt growing up, not really being able to fit into either classical or traditional world because I was brought up as a traditional player, as let's say in a traditional Irish family. It meant that there was no space for me anywhere else because that became like kind of who I had to be. And I, yeah, it was one of those things that just became slightly a bit of a weight in the shoulders for a while until I realized that there were actually classical musicians out there who thought folk music was cool, the way Irish language turned out to be cool, you know, 20 years later. But anyway, it's, um, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 